Well, you know how I'm going to start our uh, weekly chat now is by saying, hey, all you cool cats and kittens. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't get enough of Tiger King. Can you just? Classic. Uh, we, we've made everybody on our staff uh, watch it. And now we're actually trying to like break down like leadership archetypes and lessons learned from uh, from Tiger King. So we're trying so to make it a fun, a fun leader development program. <laughs> well, I'm trying. I'm trying to ID like who's the Carol Baskin of reenacting, you know. <laughs> but um, no, this is this is great to see everybody again this week and put names to faces and see you guys all together. It's really one of the only things I do to see other people, which is really great being locked home. Um, and last week's was really great with, with Tom and Luke talking about the Navy and the Navy being the news all this week. It's just been uh, something else. Um, uh, particularly with the, the Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier, it's dominating the news today. It's intense. Um, I've been told but, I cannot officially comment. Oh, you can't, that's right. <laughs> as a as a member service member of the u.s army i could say i feel really bad for the uh, u.s navy public affairs people right now my heart goes out to them well they're also getting bad press because of um the, the comfort is not seeing a lot of patients in new york city so it's not good well they just had a uh, the the it broke over here they apparently had a cross contamination because they weren't supposed to take COVID patients. And so apparently a couple got thrown in there the other day and that kind of throws off their entire, how they do operations are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my understanding. I was kind of confused when they said they actually they took some COVID patients onto the comfort because the original plan was for them not to have any. Yeah, and what what's, you know, the, the people that we worked with last year in Fleet Week, those are the people that are doing the press and publicity. So I'm seeing these same names pop up that were coming to our meetings and events and everything last year in New York. So um, I want to get rolling. Um, Laura volunteered to be um, our speaker. And then following her, <coughs> Jerry Lee, who's coming in from California. Um, Laura, I met, um, I guess about two years ago now. And so I'm really excited to have her on talk about uh, women in the Navy. So I'm going to turn the hosting duties over to Laura. And Laura, introduce yourself and tell us what you're talking about today. All right. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name's Laura Aidy. Uh, I actually work at a historic site in real life. The not right now, um, but it's an 18th century site. Uh, so this is a little bit different for me. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is the Yeoman F uh, in World War I. Uh, I don't have a lot of stuff for it because there's just not a lot that it survived. Uh, so the only piece of uniform uh, that I have is the cape that is behind me, and I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about that in the presentation. Um, I have also a few little bits here and there. Uh, I've got a set of the Liberty Loan buttons, um, and you see them, especially the V one, the fifth. Liberty Loan, the Victory Liberty Loan, um, you see them sometimes on the lapels of the women in the Navy. Uh, a really easy thing to zoom in and see because the, the yeah. video is very obvious. Uh, I also just quarantine bought uh, this cylinder magazine that has a Yeoman F uh, on the cover. Uh, it doesn't really have much uh, in the way of articles or anything inside, um, but it was still a piece that I've been looking at for a while. Uh, so I'm going to be putting up a slideshow here 
to talk about this stuff again because I don't have a lot of things to show, um, but I do have a lot of images. Um, a big, big, big um, because let me see if I can get this uh, rolling to share my screen. Sia, ever and does anybody see the Olympia? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right, so uh, I am part of the Living History crew for the Olympia in Philadelphia with the Independent Seaport Museum, uh, and they have been really welcoming of having uh, the Yeoman F impression as part of the World War I interpretation, uh, though, uh, as I'll talk about, the women didn't serve aboard ships like the Olympia for the most part. Uh, there was a huge presence at the Philadelphia Naval Yard. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about how women started in the Navy and kind of what their role was during World War I. But of course, I start with a picture of a old white dude um, to talk about women in the Navy. But um, Josephus Daniels was the Secretary of the Navy at the time. Um, and once the Naval Act of 1916 had passed, um, he was tasked with expanding the Navy into a much, much larger service than it ever had been, um, not only in the construction of ships, but also in the staffing of the Navy. And he was facing a huge manpower shortage. So he proposed that women be allowed to enlist as yeomen. Uh, he pointed to wording in the 1916 uh, regulations that created the U.S. Naval Reserve uh, that said all persons who may be capable of performing special useful service for coastal defense. And he said, it doesn't say male, it says persons. Uh, that doesn't preclude women from joining. That was met with some resistance um, from some of the you know, top Navy brass, but uh, they proceeded with the plan to enlist women uh, in the Navy as yeomen. And the first person to sign up was Loretta Perfectus Walsh. Uh, she had the absolutely coolest name ever in the history of the world. Um, she was 20 years old. She was from Oliphant, Pennsylvania, and she had already been working as the secretary to the commander of recruitment at the Philadelphia um, Naval District, um, and she ended up enlisting on March 17th, 1917, so um, just a little under a month before the U.S. joined the war. Uh, and she was promoted to Chief Petty Officer just a few days later on March 21st. Uh, mm -hmm. Rose up through the ranks real fast. <laughs> uh, she also was apparently issued a pistol and a cutlass, and she was kind of like, uh, I wear these? This is a thing? Uh, but they really just, they had no protocol for how to handle this. Um, and you'll see as we go on, her uniform doesn't look like what anybody else wore because she was just wearing um, a men's uh, jacket and then a skirt, um, but otherwise dressed as a, just a male CPO. Uh, now, soon after she signed up, uh, word got out. There were lots and lots of newspaper articles talking about her, um, and other women started to flock to their local uh, recruiting stations to try and sign up. Uh, not all of them were ready, <laughs> but uh, they quickly started enlisting the women. Um, now they were supposed to be able to type at least 45 words per minute uh, or take 100 per words per minute of shorthand or have quote unquote extensive business experience. Uh, but there's one account, uh, a woman named Estelle Kemper later on talked about her service and she said she didn't even know how to answer the question of how many words per minute she typed. Uh, she'd only ever like hunt and pecked on, you know, an old typewriter her dad had. And so she just said off the top of her head, oh, 200 words per minute. <laughs> And uh, obviously that was not true. Um, and obviously she had no idea what she was talking about, but they still took her um, and you know, she learned how to type from there. Uh, they signed up for the Navy's traditional four-year term of service. Um, and even though they weren't to serve at sea, they could be stationed anywhere that the Navy determined they needed to be. Uh, though most of the women were assigned near where they were living or where they were from, um, but a few were scattered outside the continental U.S. Um, there were girls in Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the Panama Canal Zone, and some in Hawaii. And then there were five yeomen who served with the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery for the Navy and went overseas to work with hospital units in France. Um, unfortunately, I've 
this is like the most recent thing I've found, this article um, that actually specifies one of these women. Uh, the Everything else I've found has just said five of them went to France and that's all I know. Uh, so I'm getting a little bit closer to finding out more about them specifically. Uh, otherwise, these women were many in number. Um, there were at least 11,000, possibly closer to 13,000 all told um, that served in the Navy as yeomen. Um, they came from every state and territory. Uh, New York had the most uh, with over 2,300 enlistees. Uh, District of Columbia, Massachusetts, Virginia, and Pennsylvania also had very significant contributions um, of women to the service. Their background tended to be middle and upper middle class. Uh, most, if not all of them, had a high school diploma uh, because of the type of work that they were going to be doing. And many had vocational training, uh, particularly with clerical work. Uh, some of them had college degrees. Uh, their age range was technically supposed to be 18 to 35, although there were some that signed up early and lied about their age, uh, including a 14-year-old, apparently. Uh, and then there is another article that I found recently that said they were enlisting as old as 58. Um, but more importantly, um, the muster roll for the Philadelphia Navy Yard um, that is at the Independent Seaport Museum uh, does show women into their 40s. So I get to do the impression for at least a few more years. Uh, now, Josephus Daniels is not known for his um, progressive views on race. Uh, <laughs> he was very much a segregationist, um, but there were 14 African-American women who served in the Navy as yeoman F. They were all in Washington, DC, though most of them came um, from other states in the South. Uh, and they all worked in the muster roll office under a civil servant who was an African-American man. Uh, so that's, again, something that there's not a lot of information out there. There's this one photograph, grainy photograph from a book that was written um, around 1920 uh, about the most recent war. Um, but it's something that's very interesting and begs more research. Their ranks, uh, some started off as landsmen, kind of, you know, the unranked until they got fully trained and qualified. Uh, but most of the women were either third class, second class, or first class uh, petty officers. They could be promoted to chief petty officer, uh, but none of them held uh, commissioned posts. <clears throat> their pay was the same as their male counterparts in the yeoman rating. Uh, Josephus Daniels said that a woman who works as well as a man ought to receive the same pay. So go figure. Um, the base pay for a yeoman at this time uh, was 20, 28.75 a month. Uh, and the women also received $1.25 a day. Uh, it was later raised to $1.50 for subsistence, um, and they got an annual clothing allowance of $60. Uh, now, as I've been talking, I keep saying yeoman F. Uh, the F was added because there was some confusion uh, because it was also a regular rate in the Navy, and there were lots of male yeomen who, you know, these women were intended to replace them at their stateside jobs so that they could ship out. Uh, but if you're not looking closely at the first names on paperwork, you know, you see my name, Yeoman 80. Well, okay, give her orders, uh, or give him orders, not really like, realizing that it's a woman. So they added the parentheses F for female to avoid that confusion. They were given many nicknames, though. Um, this is from uh, Broadside uh, Magazine, which was the US Naval Reserve Forces uh, magazine. Uh, again, this is at the Seaport Museum. And some of these are the stupidest nicknames. <laughs> uh, Yeomanette is the most common and what they most commonly called themselves. Uh, I definitely don't want anybody to call me a gaboon. Um, <laughs> Uh, the public reaction to the women being in the Navy was somewhat mixed. Um, there is definitely a hearty amount of sexism just in general at the time. Uh, it was still for, very new for women to be working as clerks and secretaries in offices, um, let alone doing that as an enlisted member of the Navy. Uh, 
probably the most negative opinion came from some of the old salts in the Navy who you know, thought it was you know, a insult to the uniform and they didn't think that this was appropriate. Um, there were some people who threatened to quit over it, uh, but it didn't take long once the program got rolling for uh, most of them to change their tune. Um, and they really put forth a lot uh, towards the war effort, and the Navy wouldn't have been able to function uh, at that capacity without them. I also like that this photo, they look like they are about to drop the hottest album of 1919, so <laughs> it's pretty cool. <clears throat> the Navy had no provisions for their uniforms. It became very quickly apparent that they needed to figure something out. Uh, early on, a lot of them were just wearing men's jumpers with ideally a navy blue skirt. Uh, some of them wore the Dixie cup caps. Uh, some wore the flat hats uh, without the stiffener in it so that it was more like a beret. Uh, but there just wasn't any consistency or anything official. Uh, so they did put out a uh, regulation for women's uniforms um, by end of March, early April of 1918. Um, and this specified a navy blue wool serge jacket, uh, cut in a Norfolk style um, with the pleats running in front and back, uh, a matching skirt, and then it was worn with a white cotton shirt waist, uh, the standard sailor neckerchief, or a tie, uh, and then black stockings and black heeled oxfords or lace-up boots. Uh, then it was topped off with a broad brimmed uh, felt hat uh, of Navy with either a U.S. Navy or U.S. Naval Reserve tally on the front. Uh, each of them received this yearly clothing allowance, and while some seem to have gotten issued uniforms, that isn't really the norm. Um, for the most part, they were expected to go out and buy them. Uh, there's advertisements for uh, department stores. It's actually one of the few original uniforms that survives uh, in a museum collection is uh, from Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, when they were still making, you know, high quality sports clothing. <clears throat> and um, some women may have uh, made their own, uh, especially the summer uniform, uh, which was white cotton drill. Uh, it was cut the same as the winter one, it just, the jacket wasn't lined. Um, and then they wore a broad brimmed straw boater hat with it. And then white stockings and white shoes of the same specs were requested for summer use, although these girls from New Orleans, uh, apparently not all of them got the memo on that. They then approved later on uh, capes for winter use, uh, and that's what I have here. Um, it's a you know, heavy wool uh, melton with lining uh, and similar, cut similar to an officer's boat cloak. Uh, they also could wear shirt sleeves when they were working or when it was hot. Um, these girls seem to be, you know, off duty for the day. They've got their shirt sleeves even rolled up, uh, but it was acceptable to wear the shirt sleeves without the jacket on top. But there was a lot of variation, uh, partly because it was such a new service and partly from the early confusion with having no official uniforms, you see uh, a lot of weird stuff happening. Uh, one newspaper account noted that certain pretty young yeoman Fs have been dolling up in pink waists pretty hose of all the colors in the rainbows and snappy fitting shoes. Uh, this resulted in some memos coming out that said, you know, if you are not gonna wear the uniform, don't wear the uniform. Wear either all uniform or all civilian, none of this mixing and matching stuff. Uh, the training was also somewhat hit and miss, um, depending on what the job was. Um, depending on what their particular previous uh, experience had been in civilian life, um, partly dependent on the staffing needs and availability of training. Uh, some got fairly extensive training in a particular, particular skill set. Others were just basically said, you know, here's a jumper, show up on Monday ready to work. Uh, the majority of them were clerical staff, um, commonly serving as secretaries, stenographers, typists. Uh, some worked as translators, uh, others deciphered code. 
Um, they were telephone and radio operators and telegraphists. Uh, some of them were draftsmen. Uh, some were camouflage artists uh, that designed and tested the dazzle painting for battleships. Oh, wow. uh, and uh, with the new science of fingerprinting, uh, the Navy also needed experts at taking and reading fingerprints. Um, the Navy had you know, been issuing the tags that have the etching of the thumbprint or the index fingerprint. Uh, so that was part of their role as well. Uh, there were others who worked at assembling munitions. Uh, and while they were not nurses, uh, that's a whole separate thing. Uh, there was an Navy Nurse Corps. It was an auxiliary organization. It actually started before this, but it, it's the whole another can of worms. Uh, but some of the Yeoman F did work in hospitals and laboratories for the Navy. Um, there were a few that worked as pharmacists even. Uh, and a number of them, especially ones like Loretta Walsh that uh, enlisted early on, worked in recruiting offices. And beyond their day-to-day -day tasks, they were often asked to do um, parades and liberty loan drives, um, sell liberty loan bonds. And uh, while they weren't being sent off to fight, uh, some of them did learn how to handle a rifle. Uh, there were some drill teams. Uh, now, again, this is not meant for them to actually go and <laughs> go out and fight, but it was for the parade and morale boosting kind of stuff. The Navy did not have accommodations for the women for the most part. Um, there were a few barracks that were deemed acceptable for female habitation, um, a few uh, houses that were converted over to use, but a lot of the women um, either lived at home, uh, lived with family members who were nearby to where they worked, or rented rooms. Some of them, you know, went in together, rented a house, um, and split up like that. Uh, but that's why they received that daily subsistence pay in addition to their regular pay, because unlike the regular Navy, they didn't have anywhere for them to live. Uh, they did a lot of outings and day trips. Uh, mm. These are some women who are in uh, New York City at the uh, Catholic Women's League. Uh, they were there for the Victory Liberty Loan Parade in May of 1919. Um, they actually caught some flack for this picture in particular, being shown playing pool in uniform. I don't think there was as much outcry on this one. <laughs> it's the same group of girls. Uh, I love this picture as well. We tried to recreate it with Todd one time. Uh, I don't know that we, re we totally captured the original. It's close. Uh, I'm sorry. It's close enough. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, they also, you know, had them attend fairs, uh, and the women also spent some of their free time doing things like visiting soldiers in hospitals. Uh, this is Walter Reed. Um, they knitted for the troops. Did more of that um, money raising, uh, supply raising for the war effort. <clears throat> There were also quite a few sports teams, uh, especially rowing. Uh, it's the Navy, after all. We've got to get boats in there somehow. Uh, they also, though, had other organized sports, including a baseball team, um, basketball team. And one of the team captains uh, from one of the basketball teams uh, apparently beat out 25 sailors and... Uh, qualified as marksmen at a uh, shooting match. So uh, they had a lot to do. Uh, after the war ended, uh, most of these women, well, none of them had served their full four-year term. Uh, so it was not really clear at first how this was all going to play out. Um, but they were released from active service by the end of July 1919, but kept on the Naval Reserve rolls as inactive. So they drew partial pay um, until the end of their enlistment term. Once they were discharged, they received full veteran benefits, um, the same as the, the men would have. Um, after the war, um, what became of Loretta Walsh? Sadly, um, she was one of the many people who fell ill with yeah. influenza um, in October of 1918. And while she survived that, she never fully recovered, uh, contracted tuberculosis, and uh, she died at the age of 29 uh, in 1925. Mm. Yeah. 
on a happier note, um, somewhat, her life was pretty crazy too. Um, Joy Bright Hancock uh, was also a chief petty officer during World War I. Um, she was actually from uh, Cape May Courthouse. Um, her dad was pretty much the person who started Wildwood, New Jersey, uh, which you can say yay or nay, I don't know. Uh, but she, after World War I, stayed on as a civil servant. Uh, they got the same veterans, you know, preferential uh, rate for going into the civil service. Uh, so she worked with the Navy Aeronautics Division uh, throughout uh, the interwar years. <laughs> In, in 1925, the Navy amended the, those 1916 regulations about the Naval Reserve and specifically changed the wording to say men instead of persons, which was very frustrating for these women who had served during World War I and felt that they had proven themselves. But part of it was just that the Navy was like, well, we're not going to have another war. This was the war to end all wars, after all. We are not going to need women in the Navy anymore. That was just a one-time deal. Close that loophole up. Uh, and then, you know, World War II happens. Uh, Joy Bright was one who championed the waves being created. Uh, in 1942. She pushed hard for that and she was actually commissioned in as a lieutenant. Here she's uh, pictured as a lieutenant commander in 43. Uh, she stuck with the Navy after the war ended and was also a driving force behind the transition uh, for women to be in the regular Navy and not a separate service. Uh, so she was one of the first to transition over. She actually retired from the Navy as a captain in 1953. So despite the setbacks uh, and the lack of proper recognition they've had in later years, uh, the Yeoman F program paved the way for women in the Navy today. Um, and you know, like all the other women services of the time uh, and even civilian women's work during the war, uh, it really helped to push the idea of women's suffrage uh, to fruition. Uh, so thank you for uh, letting me talk your ears off about this. I literally have like millions of pictures I uh, could share, but I had to stop myself at like 80 pictures. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? And her awesome background. Are you going to be publishing all this? Is there somewhere we can see all this later? Um, <laughs> I had not thought about that. Like a book uh, or blog or something, maybe? Uh, there's actually um, somebody who is with the Navy, uh, Regina Akers. Is that right, Tom? Uh, that is correct. Uh, Dr. Uh, Regina Akers. Yeah, she has um, published... Um, a small book uh, about the service. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm not really a writing type of historian. I'm a talking and flailing my arms about interpreter historian. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, it's not really been something that I've considered. Mm -hmm. You should make an interpretive video. Oh. <laughs> or shameless plug for the Cruiser Olympia. You all can come out and see Laura because the uh, Yeoman F are an integral part of our crew. <laughs> Laura, what's next? Um, that's a good question. Um, hopefully we will get back aboard Olympia before too long. Um, and we've got the second Saturdays um, with the Living History crew there. Um, we're doing a little bit more this year with um, Span Am War um, because of the Olympia's birthday, uh, but there are some that will be doing World War I uh, focus as well. And then um, there will be a, um, the soldier's timeline in the fall at Fort Mott um, will be set up in the office there and a World War I event there as well. Could you have about a half dozen Yeoman Fs, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, uh, we're all still in the process of making sure that everybody's got both uniforms. Um, and then, you know, we'll be able to be more versatile uh, in our interpretation. Great. 
So for those of you who don't know, come over to a Cruiser Olympia Living History Crew on the book face. Uh, our full schedule is there, and every time we've got something going on, we'll make sure to let everybody know. So whenever we're doing stuff at Fort Mott and otherwise, you know, check us out there, and you can keep up with our schedule. Cool. cool. Thanks, Laura. Well, Thank I wanted you. to bring on Jerry Lee because um, when Laura said that she wanted to come on, I thought, well, I want to hear about some other uniforms too. So I had to think of Jerry Lee and what price glory. Um, and I was chatting with Jerry before we. Um, started the show tonight and uh, you're still in business yeah as of today anyway we're still able to ship orders from our warehouse in dubai i am on lockdown in california now so nothing more is going to go out of here for uh, they say a month or more but uh, for now yeah we can still sh ship the orders um for those that don't know give us a little bit of the the elevator pitch how you got into this and um <laughs> I know it's, I, I've read the stories and seen all these, you know, here and there, but from the horse's mouth, how'd your company come about? Well, it was a lifelong hobby, uniforms and military equipment, which I used to collect and study. And uh, as I was retiring from the army, a friend of mine concocted a deal with Warner Brothers Studios for me to buy most of their old uniforms, which amounted to, 10 or 12 tons of uniforms. Wow. <laughs> none of which fit anybody. So, and that time there was no internet. So I had a great deal of difficulty dealing with that a lot. And I also learned that the only way to sell uniforms is to make them to fit people. So eventually I developed contacts in various countries to start making uniforms. And then the internet came along and connected me with the rest of the world wanting uniforms. And the rest is history. And what year was this? What, when was all this going down? Well, I uh, first started in 1994, just as I retired from the Army, and uh, started reproducing uniforms in 1997. And uh, shortly after that, got into high gear reproductions. And even then, I used to tell people nobody was ever going to make any money doing this. <laughs> but uh, it's turned out to be self-sustaining business. How many, um, if, you had to, if you had to give a ballpark, how many World War I reenactors do you think there are in the US? Uh, probably at least 500, maybe closer to 1,000. Um, I've sold, ew, I don't know how many hundreds of, of uniforms and I'm not the only supplier. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions for Jerry so far? Yeah, this, uh, this is Jared Nichols here. Hey, Jerry, quick question. Where, where's the weirdest place that you've had to send World War I uniforms? Huh. Well, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess there's some small island in the Pacific full of, like, uh, World War I reenactors that we just don't uh, know about or something. I do German. No, the, the weirdest place I ever had to send an order was San Pierre Miquelon, which is a rock 15 miles off the coast of Newfoundland that nobody's ever heard of. I've heard that. Postal Service. I was so, going to When they found out it was close to Canada, they sent it to Canada. And six months later, it came back because it's in Canada. And the Canadians couldn't figure out that they could just send it 15 miles away and it would be there, send it back to us. Somewhere in the postal system was a smart person who did a little research and found out that St. Pierre and Miquelon is actually a part of metropolitan France. Yep. So it went to France and from there it went back across the Atlantic to this little rock 15 miles from Newfoundland and finally got delivered six months later. Your dependability is one of your trademarks, Jerry. Aside from the uh, amazing craftsmanship, I mean, you're you're a gold standard for us uh, World War One reenactors. So no. thanks for all you. No. We really get it. Very fortunate to have some very able assistants and some very talented people making things for me. So and I can no credit for any of that. My mother gets a little freaked out when she sees incoming packages from Dubai. 
<laughs> my my little tiny mailbox here in Brooklyn cannot accommodate most of what I order, so I have them shipped to my mom in Staten Island and pick them up. She's like, "What do you know in Dubai? What are you, what are you planning?" So anyway, but thanks again, Jerry. You, you we really 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 appreciate you in the in the world. Yeah. Of community. Thanks. So far, we only had a few packages destroyed by Homeland Security. Oh, dear. Wow. Oh, man. Do you supply for a film and television as well? All the time. Yep. And I get good calls from all kinds of shows. I Let's see. Uh, well, Roswell orders stuff for me on a regular basis. Never know what they're going to need. Mm -hmm. uh, but I go back to uh, actually Saving Private Ryan. I provided some things for that in the early days. Wow. What, what's that new movie that's coming out um, about the black troops in Texas? Um, I think you pretty much outfitted them big time, right? Uh, yeah. What is that? Uh, at the 14th? I can't remember. Yeah, it's, it's called the 24th so far. Um, and They have a release date? Not yet, not that I've heard, but it, it was finished up last summer. Yeah. And uh, it called for items that only I had ever produced. So, yeah, I pretty much outfitted the entire military component of that, that film. Yeah, I remember all the summer shirts were sold out. <laughs> I said, I got a yeah. one of yours. I was just like, I was lucky to get it. I was just like, wow, that's right. But this, this campaign hat I have on here was actually a liquidation buy from Prairie Fire. Like, they had all the leftovers from the film. From, from the 24th. So a uh, buddy of mine, uh, you know, had pretty much like, they're clearing out their whole, you know, <laughs> block of what they used for the film. So if you want to get in on this, you better do it now. So a lot of people got some good things from, from your, you know, your craftsmanship as well as Prairie Flowers. So yeah, that was, that was quite, a, that was quite something. So, uh, it, yeah, I, I provided everything from stock on hand because I didn't have time to make anything. And I was, Amazed that Prairie Flower was able to make all the required hats in a very limited time allowed. Jerry, where do you, um, where, what do you think about when you're thinking about like a new item or a new product or a new release or something like a sweater or a jacket or something? Well, a lot of things go into the consideration. First of all, it has to be, generally, it has to be something that was commonly issued or seen extensively. It has to be something popular that I think will be popular. It has to be something I like or I just won't deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it's just a, an instinctive feeling whether or not such a thing will have any appeal. And most of the time, I've been right. And I get a lot of input from uh, Facebook groups now and from going to events about what people would be interested in seeing. All the various patterns of denim have been a very popular new item. Mm -hmm. Oh, I also wanted to um, have you say what, you, what I asked before the call started about the difficulties in making women's uniforms and how that's not something to really get into because yeah. of the sizing. I get asked a lot for women's uniforms and I have dabbled in it a bit, but the, the problem we have today is that women don't know how to sew anymore to make things fit and they expect things to fit. And with women in so many different shapes these days, the only thing I can do is make a sack that fits at the shoulders and you have to do the rest. Mm -hmm. And most people just aren't satisfied with that answer. Yeah. So Here's one of my long shots that will probably come out with sometime this year is the model 1899 khaki uniform with the losable collar tab or uh, shoulder tabs that are already coming loose here. But uh, this has been on hold for a while because we've been doing so many other higher priority projects and I hope we'll get this done this year. But uh, India is shut down so a lot of my production is completely off for the foreseeable future. And uh, we're just not sure what the window world situation is going to get back to normal. Have you spoken to your warehouse? Are they, oh, they're open for business now, but they're kind of waiting to see or something? Well, the warehouse is still open, yes. Uh, Dubai so far has not seen any serious problems. And uh, I guess they're not expecting any. So they're still in full operation there. 
Okay. That's cool. Have there been any items that you've uh, tried to make or remake that were just too difficult or they didn't have the machinery anymore? Yes. Currently, we are trying to make the spare parts container for the Springfield rifle, which was issued to every other rifleman in the Army. Mm -hmm. So it was a very common item and yet does not exist. I've been told that uh, replicas are made some years ago and those do not exist or at least no one lets go of them. I finally was able to obtain one last week and uh, hopefully it's in my warehouse waiting for me to open it. But we've been trying to make it from the, the ordinance drawings and specifications mm -hmm. and without the correct tools, there's, there we go. Without the correct tools, it's damn hard to make. Mm -hmm. But we're going to keep trying. Serious, I happen to have one right here, because of course yes. I do. Um, it, it's very much the same geometry as a uh, 03 Euler, 1917 Euler. It's just a little, um, I guess this is Walnut 2, basically, where it's got a spare extractor. Uh, there's a firing pin in there, and then there's a cocking piece whole thing. And it's this very thin, delicate little piece of lumber that you have to fabricate without totally obliterating it. So I can kind of understand and commiserate with uh, how that might be troublesome. Yeah, it has been a challenge, but uh, hopefully now that we have an original in hand, we'll give them some clues on how they can do this. Mm. Cool. Jerry, what do you sell the most of? The most of? Hmm, it, it varies from time to time, but uh, shoes, a lot. Trench boots and marching shoes, an awful lot of those. Um, Do you see, I, I see just running the Facebook group and the social media that it seems that there's more people getting into World War I than getting out of it. Is that something that you see too on your end? Yeah, it, it's continued to grow past the 2018 centennial. So interest is definitely continuing to expand in this era. That's great to hear. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, everybody was predicting that people were gonna get out in a huge numbers and uh, I'm not really seeing it. No, and you're not seeing much secondary market for used uniforms either. Mm -mm. So people are not getting out. So another item we hope to have this year finally is the uh, emergency ration made by Armour, the yellowish one. The uh, first production was complete failure and had to be discarded and it's being redone, been redone now with the heavier gauge metal. Hopefully we'll get those finished up soon after the world gets back to normal. Mm -hmm. At least in time for November Newville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gary, I have a, I have a sizing question. So I'm kind of a big guy <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to lose some weight, but my uh, my actual my tunic my current tunic uh, I've had it tailored, and again this is just a function of like as you were saying about the ladies I have kind of a weird you know shape thing going on right now. Um, what's your recommendation in terms of like if I wanted to order a new tunic in sizing? Uh, is it is it sort of is the rule of thumb like order a size down from what you, you know what you sort of would tailor out at like what's what's a good you know, I'm just, just looking for some basic advice if I want to get a tunic that's a little tighter fitting or closer fitting the next time. Uh, well, sizing hasn't changed in this new run, as far as I can tell. Okay. So if you've got a, a previous run, a previous one, then it should be the same size. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm, I should have phrased it better. I'm just saying like the, the one that I bought since I started was a little too big. So... Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, if I re if I order a new one, just absolutely go for the next size down of what I currently have. Like, is that the best way to guarantee it? I mean, I had it custom tailored on the sleeves and the girth, or you know. Yeah, that's probably the best way. If if you want more of a parade fit, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just go down a size. And if you're wrong, we still do exchanges without any problem. Oh, uh, this one's, <laughs> this one's got mileage on it. So, uh, uh -huh. but yeah, no, it's, it's great. I, I'm very blessed. Actually, I have a, a local tailor. Uh, and it turns out like I'll, I'll come over with uniforms from different time periods. And he was trying to figure it out. Like, what is this guy about? And everything. I finally explained it to him. Turns out he's like an Israeli immigrant and he told me that he did wardrobe in the Israeli film industry. So every time I come in, he lights up because he knows, <laughs> you know, that there's money coming on alterations and stuff. But uh, it's a great guy, a big fan. So Yeah, um, well, everybody should know someone like that because um, almost everybody took their uniforms to a tailor up until fairly recently and got them fitted. Sure. Yeah, it's important. It's important. I mean, battle dress is battle dress, but parade is parade. So just trying to find a good twain for myself. But uh, that's enough out of me. Thanks so much, Jerry. I'm really happy to see you and see it from, uh, you know, in the video. The best. That's the best we got right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Check gotta it. stay in touch. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Jerry, Jared Nichols here again. Uh, quick question. How do you how do you do your research when you're when you're doing it? Is it just a question of just getting your hands on the original? And then, or is it a question of like going to archives or traveling around and getting, collecting photos of items? Like how do you guys work that with your company? Well, I do a lot of research on, on items generally as much as I can. Getting hold of an original is the best way to, to get something. Quite often I can only get to a hold of something that's not quite original, been modified, or it's a later version of something than what I really want to make. So sometimes I have to work with the factory to convince them to make the changes from what they're seeing to what I really want. And most of the time it works. Got some good people working with me. As far as actually collecting the items, so is it just you going around and purchasing them or doing calls for people to send you stuff? Or are you going to museums, archives and collections and getting that information? Well, all of the above have happened. Whenever possible, I try to obtain a, an original sample myself. On occasions, I have borrowed things, and some museums have helped me out considerably with their input. That's cool. Um, I'm not really that familiar with anything but behind, uh, except for AEF. Are, are you making um, other combatants too? Yeah, I got talked into getting into the uh, 19th century a couple of years ago. So now we've got uh, almost everything you could need for the Indian Wars. Oh, wow. And uh, just about everything for the Spanish-American War has been produced. Not everything is continuing production, but a lot of it is. Uh, and, well, we continued on into the early 1900s with this 1899 uniform and some other early 1900s equipment. And I hope there's gonna be some continued interest in, in those eras as well. Cause it's fun making the stuff. Yeah, you know, what is the most fun thing you like? What's, what's, what's fun for you about the company? Well, just seeing my stuff in use on display in, in museums and shown in movies. I just like to see this stuff being used. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up at a time when people used original stuff and destroyed it, and it's gone forever now. And I much prefer to see my stuff getting destroyed. Span M, yeah. yeah. What did you think of 1917, Jerry? Really patently obvious question. How did you? <laughs> uh, well, it was visually stunning. And it looked like a compilation of a bunch of things that, that all really happened to different people at different times. Sure. All compressed into one movie. Uh, the only thing I found totally unbelievable is after the guy gets washed down the river and all his other adventures, his putties are still intact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know who wrapped that guy's putties. The movies know how to wrap putties really well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people were uh, a lot of people were taking umbrage with the fact that the actors had their their, res their respirators on their backs, you know, like turned around and everything. And they had to be told, yeah, well, it was a miking issue, you know, you wanted to get good audio. But, um, you know, what did you feel? How did you feel about, I mean, of what you know about British kit pattern and cut and everything? How did you feel that, you know, sort of 
how they turned out the Brit, the Brit kit head to toe. Well, I couldn't find anything to criticize about the costuming. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to have guests because people are asking me, I was like, I don't reenact Brit. Looks legit to me, but you know, I'd have to ask my Brit reenactor buddy. And, and to be fair, that weird respirator configuration that you see them using throughout the whole movie, that's um, uh, well documented. There's a couple of photos of them wearing exactly the same thing. Cool. In a different time and different place because you wouldn't, you wouldn't wear it like that in the front line. But the fact that they were wearing it in that way is totally correct. Um, given the right time and place. Good to know, Todd. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, they were on a long, they were on a long mission, right? So that makes, yeah. Jerry, are there any other uh, World War One movies or TV shows you can maybe let us know about? Nothing I can think of at the moment. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. And, uh, I'm watching uh, the. Uh, uh, an Australian uh, miniseries now on uh, Gallipoli, and if you got, I think it's on on Amazon. If you got that, it's it's well worth a watch. But like all World War One stories, it's horribly depressing. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think we're all guns for punishment. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Especially you leathernecks there. Hey, man, what can I say? <laughs> well, Paris Island was a great time. <laughs> um, Lots of respect, man. I was going to I was going to ask the uh, the group. So, um, you know, we don't really know when we're going to come out at the end of this thing, but um, I'd like to get an event in the offing that could be put together quickly like maybe with four weeks notice rather than four months notice. So if anybody has ideas on locations or places, um, hit me up. Um, I'm still continuing to work on Governor's Island. Um, to be totally honest, they haven't committed to us yet. Um, the last was that they don't want us to do camping on the National Park Service property. Um, and so we asked to camp on the trust property, which is the other part of the island. And we pitched them different locations um, and they haven't confirmed that, that we can do that yet. Um, and the worst case scenario is um, that the only place they want us to go is into the glamping area. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so we're still looking on. at other locations to go to because there's absolutely no way we could do the event without camping overnight. Um, reached out to Prospect Park and they're open to it, but they're not doing any event planning right now. Um, Prospect Park is the biggest park in Brooklyn and they do have camping there um, and does have a traditional tie to people going there for, for camping anyway. Um, but now looking at other locations to do other events. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody has ideas, any place on the East Coast. Kevin, are you looking to, to keep it close to New York City or, you know, you just said East Coast, but where are you thinking regionally to keep it? Between Maine and Virginia. Hey, just, to, just, to, just to pitch something out for my, my hometown of Staten Island, New York. I don't know if you've looked at Richmond Town, but they recently hired on a bunch of new uh, staff people, um, especially Sarah there, who's running a lot of the programming. They're younger, they're, they're reenactors, and they're usually down for living history programs. So you Sarah, can Sarah's great. I like old Richmond Town, and I did a World War I event there two years ago with, with Mark Herman and Lily um, and Steven Snyder. Um, I think for us, it's about camping and access to, you know, like the public coming to see us. Um, I like Governor's Island because it's an island um, and it's, it has a tie to World War I. Um, but I wouldn't ask anybody to suggest any places. Yeah, I only, pitched that, I only pitched that island because you guys have never done a recruiting event or an induction event or something like that. So that might be a, a good spot to do it because they have the original Staten Island Courthouse and a bunch of the buildings that have been moved from around New York City there. But just pitching, pitching it for them just because uh, I know they're good people. 
Yeah, they, they filmed Boardwalk Empire there and they have, the sets are still there too. So if you ever watch Boardwalk Empire, that's where they did the, the small town stuff. I was just about to revisit it. Yeah, I, I have like a whole, you know, you know, we're on uh, quarantine binge season here, so. Yeah. But. Um, I'd, I'd love to do something in Carlisle. And Prospect is awesome. That's, I mean, that's my local. <laughs> you know, we, we still haven't heard if the July event at the Golden Age Air Museum in, in PA is, is canceled or not or postponed. Um, I, could, I could see if I can reach out to one of our friends who, uh, who flies planes there. See what he's, he's going to say. So. Well, that's the second week in July, and that's when it's supposed to be possibly, you know, relaxed restrictions. So, uh -huh. all right. Yeah, that, that seriously is an awesome museum with all the cool planes they got. Like, you'll never see that many flying World War One planes, at least not that I know of. <laughs> uh, oh, Kevin, another one to throw at you: the West Point Museum. The West Point Museum might be a place. I know they host World War II living history stuff there before. I don't know if they've ever had World War I groups there. And I do believe they've done overnight camping on that part of the property because it's technically off the base. So therefore they have free trafficability. I did reach out to them in 2017 because we wanted to go to a football game in uniform. And they said, yeah, you can come, but you can't bring your rifles. And you're like, well, I, can't, I got my rifle. I can't go to a football game without my rifle. So, um, but it's, it was dealing with the football department, not the history department. So, yeah, you want to be dealing with the history department. The West Point Museum is its own thing run by the Army Museums folks. So it's okay. like off the base. It's not actually physically, you don't have to go yeah. through the front gate to get to it. Yeah, it's just before you get to the main gate. That'd be great. I've always wanted to do an event there and... Jared, what about Constitution Island? Uh, I no longer work there, but yeah, Constitution Island is, I believe, also run by the uh, by the museum people as well. It's considered part of the Army Museum stuff. I, I can't remember. It's been a while since I worked there. But yeah. the only time you have Constitution Island is you don't get that many people that show up to it. But uh, the West Point Museum, you just get drive-by tour buses full of Asian tourists. Well, maybe not anymore. But you used to get drive-by tour buses of Asian tourists. Got to build your brand somewhere, man. That's it. Friends, a, a shameless plug on November 14th, 2020, we're doing the uh, Armistice Day timeline aboard Cruiser Olympia. Hmm. So uh, any American impression from the beginning until now is welcome, especially Great War. So uh, yeah, one of the perks is you get to stay aboard Cruiser Olympia. You know, and we get a lot of traffic through there, you know, and folks are going to be out in force, especially if they're going to be cooped up for a while. So we typically get a lot of people aboard uh, the ship during that uh, weekend. So uh, mark it on your calendars if you want to come out and do something uh, November 14th, 2020 for the Armistice Day. That's good. That's the weekend after Veterans Day. Yeah. That's yeah, we, we specifically planned it to avoid both Newville and uh, the uh, parade in New York. The parade, um, it's still up in the air if the parade's going to continue because they're saying the the virus might come back in November, um, but if it if it doesn't, um, the the these featured service this year is the Navy, and because they canceled Fleet Week um, in May, the Navy now wants to hit New York in November for Fleet Week and have it be a big thing. So we would have a very big Navy push in November in New York. But. Um, I love the idea. And of guess that. who just happens to sell World War I naval uniforms? Just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jerry, your Navy uniforms are a hit. I've seen a bunch of people with them. Yeah, the Cruiser Olympia folks have been getting them too. Yeah, we have been doing pretty well with Navy uniforms. Um, I've been waiting for a very long time for the flat hat to get made, and I've got to nudge some people again about that when things get production, production starts again. That's cool. That's cool. Any places in Virginia? I'd like to do something in, uh, in, uh, down there too. Uh, the opening of the U S army museum is, was supposed to be at some point over the summer or into the fall. So if you get on board with them early, you can start like a perpetual relationship with that, but that's coming online. Uh, they were aiming for uh, June or July for the opening, but that's kind of, a little bit up in the air at this point. <laughs> Fort Mifflin in Philly. 
Yeah, There's that's also uh, Fort Adams up in Rhode Island. They do Civil War weekends, but it was also a World War One coastal defense fort. If Fort Mott in New Jersey is another good place, and Andy Grant, who uh, runs the place, absolutely loves hosting programs. He loves the World War One folks, so uh, that's something easy to put together. Jared, how about Fort Wadsworth? Uh, that's a pretty – yeah, Fort Wadsworth is a pretty good one. Um, it's what it's – Joe might be able to tell you who owns it now. I think it's National Park Service now. Well, we actually, we have an inn with Fort Wadsworth and we could camp there too. Um, for those who don't know, Fort Wadsworth is where the um, Verrazano Bridge comes down on the Staten Island side. And it has a sweeping view of the harbor. It's gorgeous. It's mm -hmm. stunning. Um, he places growing up on Staten Island, so <laughs> I know it well. Yeah. Fort McHenry yeah, was, also does World War I weekends every once in a while. If, if anything, it would just have to be coordinating with them to figure out when they, when they do that uh, and if they're going to be doing it again this year. Which location, Tom? Uh, Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that they do that, but I've never seen them post a schedule of when they're doing it. I always see it after it happens. They're, they're yeah. kind of bad with that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, it might be something that, you know, we, we coordinate with them and, you know, just actually set something up, a, a dedicated weekend to it, because it's usually... I saw it incorporated there. with Fort McHenry. I saw it incorporated in their schedule on um, when they celebrate um, Francis Scott Key. Uh, they Defender kind of Day. run everything all together. Yeah. Oh, wrong war. Yeah. I mean, they just kind of run everything together because Fort McHenry was a receiving hospital for... World War One patients. I mean, really, what I would like to see between now and 2022 is doing events in every state and moving it around and drawing people to other forts and states and being able to spend a weekend exploring other cities and not just think of New York City, but spread the love around. Then that's the way to grow the hobby is to get in front of more people, different people. If you have an event at Fort Mifflin, you can combine that with a trip to Olympia. Yeah, I know some guys do the dope both, right, right, Luke? Yeah, the, the probably the problem with Fort Mifflin is that they are uh, making it a, a rental thing. So if you, you have to host a program and you've got to pay the rental fee. Yeah, we had, yeah, we had thought about as the uh, the Cruiser Olympia crew co-hosting that with another group. And uh, the, the, the big hang-up point is that paying the rental fees to do it. Let yeah. me to that uh, because I was I was part of an organizational team when we had a World War II Eastern Front event there at the end of January. Uh, basically what worked for us was to get a pre-registration as soon as possible, uh, six months, and the rental fee was contingent upon who pre-registered. So basically the call out was to reenactors, if you want this to happen, we'll find a weekend but y'all have to, you know, PayPal a pre-registration free up front and we have to find a threshold. You know, uh, the POC was great. He said, otherwise we're going to lose out to like a Boy Scout ghost tour. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it, it you know, it, it, six months could be a good lead out. It could be, it, it could be that way. Um, Mifflin's a good layout. Uh, we've had some good times there, but I, I, I just, it's something to consider. You just, you need to get sort of a groundswell that's something you would really need to like get the word out uh, coming up on Newville and, and people would, you know, something like next spring or something, uh, plague permitting, as I say now, uh, you could probably get something going if you got enough of a good pre-registration uh, roster going. So I'm just throwing that out there in terms of Mifflin. I, and the guy that was the point of contact for the uh, Eastern Front event, he's, he's been volunteering there for like decades. So he's got a really good in over at, at Mifflin uh you know so i mean like now we're gonna have like two eastern front events a year because we have good draw from good pre-registration people really want to go so right. i'm saying it's like anything else man you gotta you gotta get a build a good build in enough advance but not too far in advance you know because reenact your calendars fill up quickly we're a fickle lot but if you you know say say to somebody look you literally have a stake invested in making this event happen it it, it was great we had a great time. So I, that's just my Yeah, a lot of us used to do, uh, there was a World War One event there in, I think, early March, 